Welcome to Art Talk. On behalf of Ukrainian Canadian Art Foundation, allow me to introduce my esteemed guest today, renowned award-winning Canadian painter Peter Shostak, who joins us from Courtenay, British Columbia. Hello, Mr. Shostak. Nice to have you with us. Hello, Rana. Nice to be with you. Uh, thank you for joining us. And before we start uh, our conversation, I would like to uh, introduce you to our viewers. Peter Shostak was born and raised on a farm in northern Alberta. His early interest in art inspired him to major in art at the University of Alberta. In 1969, he obtained a graduate degree in art education and then took a teaching position at the University of Victoria. He remained there as an associate professor of art education until 1979, when he decided to leave teaching and pursue a career as an artist, devoting all of his time to painting and silkscreen printing. Much of Shostak's art reflects his memories of growing up on the prairies during the late 40s and 50s. Three publications, When Nights Work Long, Saturday Came But Once a Week, and Haki, Under Winter Skies, revealed some of his personal history. Shostak's most ambitious project, to which he devoted five years of painting, was completed in 1991 with the unveiling of his series, For Our Children. These 50 large oil paintings that portray early pioneer settlement in Western Canada based on Ukrainian pioneer experiences have been exhibited across Canada. All 50 paintings, along with background stories gleaned from Shostak's many years of research, are reproduced in the coffee table book for our children. In the introduction to this book, Valgardson states, in his life and his art, Peter Shostak depicts what it means to be Canadian. He honors the memory of all our past lives. In 2003, Peter Shostak received the Queen's Golden Jubilee Medal in recognition of his outstanding exemplary contribution to Canada. He also is the recipient of the Taras Shevchenko Medal, the highest honor awarded by the Ukrainian Canadian Congress. The medal recognizes exceptional achievement in culture and the arts and is measured by the recipient's level of excellence and initiative, body of work, peer recognition, and the impact both within and outside the Ukrainian-Canadian community. Other awards include Western Showcase at the Calgary Stampede, an annual juried world-class exhibition Best New Artist Flatwork, and Western Art Auction Best New Artist Flatwork. Major cities in Canada have repeatedly hosted exhibitions of his work, and he has completed many commissioned paintings and serigraphs for individuals, organizations, and major corporations. After living in Victoria for many years, he now lives in Courtenay, BC. Shostak frequently returns to his native Alberta to photograph and refresh his mental images of prairie life and landscape. Thank you very much, Mr. Shostak, for waiting so patiently, <laughs> listening to your biography. <laughs> cut it down a little bit. It's very impressive. Congratulations. Now let's okay. start uh, with our questions. Um, how you became a painter, when and where did you start taking painting lessons? Who introduced you to painting and who was your first teacher? Wow, that's a lot of questions there. Um, I really started doing, creating art when I was five years old, six years old. The need to create something for me was, that was me. That was, I was born with that desire to be a creator. and. I really didn't take any art lessons from anyone. In fact, I did not see an original painting until I was at university. Uh, so I had no instruction. Um, it was basically use whatever material was available. Fortunately, I had a herself was, a, was an artist and she recognized my interest in art. So she would give me paper to take home when the other children weren't looking to see that they didn't want to make me a, a favorite. So. Uh, she she encouraged me in the, in that sense, but uh, I was basically self-taught. It was a question of saving up enough money when I was in grade six to send away to the Eaton's catalog or through the Eaton's catalog and buy my first set of tiny little tubes of oil paint. I had no idea how to use them. Um, 
so I started. I just just kept kept on my own, and uh, so the interest was always there. The uh, need to create was always there. Um, so first art lessons as such were at university. I think it was during my second year when I was able to take a beginning uh, painting course, and that's really the only painting course I ever took. How about your parents? Did they notice your talent and did they support they did. you in any way? Life, life, life was difficult on the farm. We lived in, in very pioneering situations. I mean, we had no, no running water. I mean, the, the well was down uh, the road and, or, or in a yard. Uh, we had no electricity. Uh, it, was, it was tough. It was, it was very difficult. It was very cold. It's not like today. I mean, things have really warmed up. Uh, so my mother was creative in her own sense and then she uh, during the long winter evenings would do embroidery she was very very good at that and and did a lot of embroidery so to say that someone was artistic in the family i i don't know uh, the the living conditions were such that it didn't provide the opportunity for someone to uh, uh, go that way we were so busy trying to to stay alive. What Canadian or world painters influenced your formation as an artist later on? I really can't say there's any one artist. Uh, I think uh, more I can talk about the Canadian art scene. Um, the Canadian artists basically, most of the artists in Canada that use Canada as, as, as their starting point are landscape painters. Uh, but for me, I was more interested in my experiences of, of just daily life, of, of growing up. So artists such as William Craigoff, uh, who depicted early 1700s uh, life in, in, in Quebec, uh, certainly, uh, you know, I, I was interested in looking at his work. Um, more recently, we have people like uh, David Blackwood, who is doing and ha has done and is continuing to do in his prints, especially the Newfoundland life. Uh, we have um, Alan Sapp, the native artist, I don't know whether you're familiar with him, uh, is a Saskatchewan artist who basically just painted his, his life of being a native, uh, growing up and, and uh, you know, the, life, the life that he, he went through. And certainly more, more importantly for me was William Kurelik because when, when he did do the paintings, and, and uh, I'm sure he was encouraged by uh, uh, Isaac's gallery to move away from his heavy, heavy uh, subject matter that he was painting, uh, when he painted the Prairie Boys Winter, Prairie Boys Summer, this received a lot of uh, recognition and it influenced me because say okay here's here's an artist who has had uh, experiences farming experiences that are very similar to mine and, and uh, he's he's able to use these for for his painting so I thought okay uh, there's no reason why why I can't go that's the similar route so uh, these are the people that, that I would say have had an influence on me certainly in terms of looking at art uh, you know, whether it's Andrew Wyeth or, 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 or uh, some of the other uh, classical uh, painters, uh, yeah, I, I enjoy their work and I look at it, but it certainly is not the style that, that is, is my style. I develop my own style, whether it's, you know, good or bad, or, but it, that's, that's my handwriting. That's, that's my style. Before you decided to devote yourself entirely to art, and being a full-time artist, you taught art education at the University of Victoria. What led you to this change, and was it an easy decision? In the back of my mind that I wanted to be a full-time artist. Uh, I didn't want to uh, go through the teaching career and, and come out at the other end at 65 or whatever and say, I wonder what would have happened had I become a full-time artist. So that was always in the back of my mind. And yes, I enjoyed the the university life, it was uh, an opportunity for me to, to meet a lot of people, to, to travel. Um, so that was always in the back of my mind. The decision was not an easy one. I mean, there I was, associate professor, full tenure, of guaranteed wages, I could stay on there until until I retired. So it wasn't early, you know, a diff, an easy decision, but I didn't jump into it without really sort of analyzing it. I was lucky in that 
I did, after seven years at the university, receive a sabbatical, which gave me a whole year to just do what I wanted to do, which was now to paint in the daytime rather than just paint in the evening, uh, which was the case when I was teaching. So it gave me a chance to, to develop my own work. It gave me a chance to travel across Canada and to have a look at the art scene and, and, and assess as, as to what was going on. And, and uh, you know, there were a number of things that, that kind of fell into place. Um, more importantly, I, I noticed that the art scene was not that crowded. Uh, certainly not in Western Canada. There weren't that many that many artists. And, and uh, when I approached galleries to handle my work, uh, I was received quite positively. And, and getting into a gallery today is extremely, extremely difficult. Um, the other thing that, that was happening at that time, it was, so we're talking about 77, 78, 79, was that the print market, both reproductions and original print market, was very, very strong. And I saw that as, as an area that I should get into. And because of this, I, I did, during that sabbatical year, uh, start learning how to do silk screen printing. And because it, to survive just on paintings was, was, was going to be difficult. So the, the print market was strong. And, and I, I selected silk screen printing because the equipment required for silk screen printing was not that complicated uh, compared to uh, doing lithographs. Um, and the other more important thing was that my wife decided to stay at home and, and raise, raise our, our, our son. Uh, she left her teaching uh, career and she decided to stay at home and, and uh, she said she'd be my business manager. And, and if any artist tells you that you don't need a business manager, they're wrong. Uh, because if you try to to do everything, uh, it's it's extremely difficult. Um, the other thing was the positive response to my to my work. Uh, so in 1977, I had my first Toronto exhibition at the art gallery that that Schiffer and Hughes, uh, had had set up. Um, the response was great. I, I was I was I was uh, able to at that time to meet uh, William Kurelik. He came to the exhibition. He, I talked to him. Um, he wanted one of my paintings. I said, "Well, this is great." He then invited me to to his place, and so I did spend a whole day with him. This was in February of 1977. I spent a whole day with him, so I did see his uh, house in, on the Balsam Avenue. I saw the, the little um, coal bin that was his uh, studio. I mean, it was basically like a coffin thing uh, with, the, with a metal door. And uh, I was very concerned when, when I saw where he painted. I saw that he used all these spray paints. And I thought, well, this is crazy. Uh, you're inside, you know, uh, an area that's, that's three feet by six feet by, by six feet. And you're spraying paints in here. and the, that was that was Kurelik. He then uh, invited me to go with him to Niagara Falls, to the Niagara Falls uh, uh, Kulinkiewski Gallery. And his concern then was that the fashion series of paintings was there, and he was concerned that the Kulinkiewskis weren't able to maintain the temperature in the gallery itself, so that the paintings would, would not be, be harmed. So. So I went there with him. I, I, uh, I, I had met the Kulinkiewskis the, during my sabbatical year, so I knew who they were, I knew the gallery, we'd been there. But in 1977, when I went with him, uh, you know, we did see that, that they were struggling. They were having a difficult time in, in maintaining a, a decent temperature in the building, but it was cold. So, uh, but I think he did give them some money so they could uh, raise the temperature a bit and, and maintain the gallery. So. Uh, certainly, um, you know, Kurelik was, was very, very supportive of, of what I was doing. And, and I talked to him and I said, look, I'm thinking of leaving and, and painting full time. And, and he encouraged me. So he, he, he did encourage me. So, um, and also at this time, there were a number of individuals who were willing to take my silk screen prints as a portfolio and they would market these themselves. So they were. That's something they did as a, as a sideline. So whether they had other artists' work that they were also uh, selling, I'm not sure, but 
there were several that, that took my work, and, and it was uh, it, things worked out very well. So when when this is the landscape that I saw and what was happening, I thought, okay, uh, maybe I can take a year's leave without pay. So I took a year's leave without pay, knowing that if things didn't work out, I could always go back. So I took a year's leave without pay in 1979, and and uh, things worked out very well. And I handed in my resignation. And so since since that day, I've been in the studio. I've been full-time artist. Very interesting. You didn't come to the decision lightly. But, no, no. But many circumstances came together at the same time, and the support of your partner, your wife. And Absolutely, yes. Relix encouragement, very interesting. Uh, what is your favorite medium in painting and why? Oh, the medium, I, well, it's oil, oil paints. I, I did try acrylics a little bit, but I found the colors were not uh, the same as, as oils and, and they just didn't work. So I, I've been an oil painter, although I did do spend a few years on the side doing watercolors. But I haven't done a watercolor for, for a long time, so basically it's good old oil paint. Oil paint. Mm -hmm. And how do you describe your style? Shostak style. <laughs> I don't know. It, it's, real, it's realistic. It's a realistic in, in one sense, yet in the other sense, it's, I'm not overly concerned about absolutely every detail. Uh, so it's, it's kind of my, my shortcut to, to realism, to uh, my image of uh, I'm, I'm trying to get the message across, so I'm, I'm, I'm a message painter. I'm telling a story in, in, in my paintings, and you know, uh, so people gravitate to my paintings. I think initially because of the story, uh, and then later, hopefully, it's because of the way it was painted. Uh, certainly, my dark skies are a signature piece for me. I did the first dark sky painting I did seriously was back in 1982 probably. Uh, I liked the painting very much so I thought oh I'm not going to sell it if we're going to do reproductions of it. Which is, and, and these ended up in, in the different galleries including the, the one commercial gallery in Toronto. Um, they, they had the, painting, the uh, reproduction and they called me one day and they said is the painting still available and I said yes. We have a very good collector that wants to buy it, and I said, well, okay, who? And they said, Bob Hope. I said, oh, okay. So we ended up selling the painting to, to Bob Hope. I guess since that point, I guess, my dark sky paintings, they are unique. There's, there's no one else that's, that's doing it. Um, have, have been extremely important. When people go to buy a painting of mine for the first time, the first painting they ever buy, usually they'll buy a dark sky painting. Recently, a friend of mine posted your paintings on her Facebook page, and there was a discussion about one of your dark sky paintings. You know, like people were saying what um, they feel, like what, what's the messages. For example, to me, it was. It was very peaceful, starry night. Was it, you know, the painting? There is a church in the middle, positioned in the middle. But to me, it seemed a little bit disturbing. Like you're waiting for something to happen. Oh, okay. So, and somebody else, you know, said, "Oh, and uh, it looks very peaceful and serene to me." So uh, your dark sky paintings definitely touch people, and and people have different impressions too. Your messages come across differently. Yes, they do. They do have different reactions. The other, the other aspect of, of my paintings is, is, is the titling. And most artists, or a lot of artists, will title a painting saying, well, landscape number six, or, or um, autumn colors. I decided to, in most cases, make the title a question or a comment. It could be part of the conversation that is going on with the people within the, the painting itself. A question usually will get the viewer to stop and think and come up with their own answer. Uh, so this was something that, that was, that was uh, unique and, and is unique in, in terms of uh, my, my title. It also in, encourages the conversation, if it's a question or a yeah. thought. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Thank you for that reply. 
Uh, in your art, one can see the reflections of you growing up in the prairies. In your publications, when nights were long, Saturday came but once a week, and hockey under winter skies, all of them reveal some personal history. Did your Ukrainian background influence your development as an artist, and to what extent? I don't know that my Ukrainian background influenced uh, my development as an artist. It was, it was the experiences of where I grew up. I mean, my experiences were the same as those of the French family that lived two miles away from us or the um, English family, we didn't have too many English families, but we did have where we lived, uh, people who had come from the United States and were now living in the bush. Uh, so my experiences were, were very similar, so I can't say it was anything about the Ukrainian aspect of it. It was, uh, I guess the Ukrainian content comes out with some of the subject matters that I like to paint, so that if I'm uh, dealing with, with any activities that are typically Ukrainian, and yeah, that, that's, that's Ukrainian, but uh, someone who is French would probably do the same thing with, with their culture. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say the Ukrainian part of it had, had a lot to do with it. Uh, it's just, just where I grew up and the experiences. Just the prairie experiences. Yes. Please tell me about your series for our children. Where the idea for this series came from and what was your inspiration and how long did you work on this monumental project? It was monumental. It was, well, I was always aware of the fact that, that uh, the centennial was coming. Uh, I was aware of the hardships that the first pioneers endured. Um, in 1973, my, my father died suddenly. So I spent, I spent the summer months photographing all of the Ukrainian folk architecture in one county in, in, in Alberta. The county of Smoky Lake, which is northeast of Edmonton, was settled predominantly by Ukrainian people in 1900. 1900-1905, and a lot of the first buildings were still there, so I just drove all the roads, I think it was like 800 miles worth of roads that I drove, and I photographed uh, these buildings, and they, they have become very, very important for me, and not only for me, but for people that are doing research. Um, so I, I was certainly aware of the early experiences, uh, both in terms of doing some reading, and with the centennial coming up, I thought, okay, uh, this should be done. Who's going to do it? I mean, Karelik had died by then. You know, had he lived, probably he would have undertaken a, a project that would in some way celebrate the, uh, or I wouldn't say celebrate, but I guess uh, remember the, the 100 years of, of uh, the, the first first pioneers. So, so it was. I decided I wanted to do it, and, and you know, so what are you going to do? So I thought, well, I'm going to do it, I must well do it big. Uh, so I, I decided to, to paint 50 paintings. They were all the same size, they were all three feet by three feet, they're square, big, big paintings. And, and uh, um, I started painting them, I think, five years before the centennial in 1991, and my goal was to paint one a month. So you're painting one a month for the series, but you also have to paintings for commercial end of it. I mean, I still had to, uh, had to uh, produce paintings that, that were going to be for sale. So these these paintings were not for sale; they were uh, uh, put aside. And, and uh, so I worked on it for for five years, and uh, we did research. My wife helped with the research. We hired an assistant. Um, who, you know, we did research more for the story part, uh, for the stories that are, that are in the, in the, for our children, children box. So it was a big project. And once you kind of got into it, you can't say, well, I guess I'm not going to finish it. Uh, so I, I'm quite disciplined. Uh, in fact, that's probably one of the, uh, uh, personal characteristics that, that uh, enabled me to, to be successful is that I am disciplined. I, I, I don't wait till the last minute. I don't wait for the spirit to move me. Uh, I just 
it's a job. You get up in the morning and you've got a studio. So you go in the studio and either you're painting or, or you're doing research or you're looking at something. Um, so once I started, it was okay, you've got to finish it. Discipline helps. And thank you very much and your team for this project. This will definitely be memorable for our children. Yes, yes, yes it is. And you mentioned a little bit before about um, Shafranyuks and their gallery. Now tell me uh, about your collaboration with Ukrainian Canadian Art Foundation and how many exhibits you held there. Well, I knew I knew the Shafranyuks, I guess, because of my exhibitions. Uh, certainly, the first one was in 1977, and then uh, you know we, I got to know them. I got to know them uh, both of them. Uh, his wife was. Uh, was quite the lady. She was, uh, I mean, they were already getting up in years. I know she was in her, I think, early 80s, and then, boy, she drove in Toronto with that car, like, to be sitting there. I said, whoa, he didn't drive. Uh, her husband didn't drive. Mr. Schiffer and you didn't drive. She drove. Uh, so we, we knew them quite well, both, both my wife and I, and uh, certainly an extremely supportive man. He was a, a very good salesman. He was, he was excellent in terms of promotion and, and uh, Certainly, with his uh, then um, the buying the, the the larger building where where Kof was at on, on Bloor Street. Um, number of exhibitions. I think I had five exhibitions in, in total, uh, with it in his original gallery and then in in the, in the larger a larger gallery. You already shared some memories about Shafranyu. Any else you would like to add about them? Uh, not really. Well, I would like to say I'd like I'd like to thank them in terms of uh, their dedication that they had uh, during their adult life, uh, uh, a job or, or a business, and then they decided that they were going to devote their retirement years to the collection and and to the. Um, promotion of, of Ukrainian Canadian art. So uh, they were excellent, excellent people to deal with. Where do you see yourself in Canadian contemporary art scene in the near future? And are you working on any new projects right now? In the near future? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I see myself as, as sort of getting in line or, or being a part of the group of artists uh, who are painting and have painted uh, the Canada, the the people within the this this huge this huge landscape, uh, rather than just a landscape painter, it's it's activities. I mean, in the United States, we're all familiar with Norman Rockwell. Um, for him, the, the the person was was very large in, in the in the uh, pick, in the paintings. Uh, the landscape occupied very little space. Uh, mine is the opposite. Uh, mine, the people in the landscape are generally quite small. And uh, it's the landscape that, 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 that is quite is quite big. So I guess if I'm going to be placed anywhere, it's going to be along with with uh, you know, with, with people like like with, with Sap and, and some of the other artists that are depicting uh, life as as it existed and, and as as it exists. In terms of future projects, I don't have any major projects set up. I'm just kind of happy to, to be where I'm at and, and to uh, continue continue painting and um, yeah, slow down a little bit. But in the wintertime, what else are you gonna do? You can't, you can't do much, so I'm fortunate that I, you know, I, have a, I have a nice studio and a comfortable studio and I have all this thousands and thousands of photographs and slides that I took over and photographs of, of Canada, the landscape has disappeared. I mean, I, I, uh, recently started, I thought, you know, painting just churches, just doing small paintings of churches, uh, Ukrainian churches, although I've done a few other non-Ukrainian ones. It's interesting that that, uh, that some of these paintings are bought by non-Ukrainians. So obviously, they, they relate to the typical, the unique prairie architecture. We have two, two types uh, on, on the prairies. We have the architecture of, of the Ukrainian church, which is easily recognizable in the tiny churches. To the larger ones with the, with the banya and, and, and everything else. Um, on the other ar uh, architecture, which is unique to Western Canada, were the elevators. Well, the elevators have disappeared. Uh, I don't think you can find an elevator anymore. Uh, but the Ukrainian churches, they're still there, but unfortunately, some of them are disappearing. Some of them are, are uh, I, I learned of one that I've photographed many times, a beautiful church that burnt down because of lightning strike, just 
Europe about two years ago. So uh, even even that is uh, that is changing. Uh, what advice would you give to aspiring young artists? Well, you have to be dedicated. You have to be focused. You have to try to differentiate yourself, uh, remove yourself from the field in some way. You have to be recognizable in terms of what you paint and how you paint. Uh, but if you're copying, and, and there's, there's, there's no problem with a young artist copying someone else's style or, or way of painting, but you have to eventually branch out on your own. And you have to be consistent. You can't jump around. You can't say, I'm going to spend three years painting this way and next you know, five years uh, you know, doing this or that. Uh, there has to be, a, you have to establish a brand, if you want to use the word, a brand where people can identify it as being you know, your work and not someone else's. Uh, you know, for me, fortunately, I've had people come and tell me that they can walk into a house and just across the room, if there's a painting of mine, they, they can recognize that it's being mine without seeing the, the, the signature. Uh, so that, that, that's important. You, you have to be unique. You have to, and you've got to stay with it. It's, 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 a, it's, a tough, it's a tough road. Today, I don't know that, that uh, if I were to do this again, I don't know. I really don't know. It's 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 tough. It's tough because competition is there. I mean, people today have where to spend their money. Uh, when I was growing up, you didn't spend two hundred dollars a month on a, on a on the phone. Um, you didn't travel very much. Whereas today, the options are there. You, you're you know, there, there's so many places that that people can spend their money. So it's. Um, yeah, it's it's tough. I don't want to leave things on a negative note. I mean, I still want to encourage people to to uh, you know to really really that's you. If that's your life, and you want to be an artist, then, then go for it. Find your style as you found your Shostak style. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Lana, for giving me an opportunity to express my and send my greetings to all members of the Ukrainian. Art Federation in Toronto. It's uh, unfortunate that I'm at the West Coast. I can't meet the members of the Federation. But greetings for the new year. Hopefully things are going to change and that your creative efforts are not going to be affected by these difficult times that we are currently currently in. I want to extend my greetings also and uh, wishes, best wishes for the people that work at the Kumpf Gallery in, in Toronto. I haven't been to the new uh, facility, but uh, certainly have seen it on TV many times. So keep up, keep up the good work. Um, when I look at the, um, what's happened in Canada with the immigration of Ukrainians, the four different waves. Uh, during the first three waves, we had the pioneers. The first group was basically concerned with just surviving, with making a living. It's the second and the third group. We have had, with, with the three, first three waves of immigrants uh, to Canada, we find that the first basically was trying to survive. When they ended up on the 160 acres of, of bush, and, and trying trying to make a living. That's this was the most important uh, part of their existence. It's the second and the third wave who some now started to come not just to live on the prairies in the bush, but certainly the third wave. Most of the immigrants that came came to the cities, and it's these groups of individuals that built all these churches. Although the early pioneers built little churches, but it's the second and third wave that started to build bigger churches, to build halls, and to build cultural centers. Unfortunately, no one undertook the building of an art collection, and no one undertook the building of a facility that would house a Ukrainian Canadian art collection. This does not exist in Canada. Uh, we are fortunate in some ways in that we have the two individuals in, in Ontario. We have the Kulinkiewskis with Niagara Falls and their collection. Um, 
in Toronto, we have Mr. and Mrs. Shafranyuk, who were very instrumental with their collection and with setting up the, the little gallery, and it now has become what, what we refer to as Kuhn. And Kuhn is playing a very important role, I think, in the visual arts scene in, in Toronto, and more success, and, and certainly the collection itself, I hope, I hope it, it grows. Um, and, and I understand that there is some desire and, and certainly a need to digitize the paintings that are in the collection because right now uh, the only way you're going to know is you have to go down to to the gallery itself so i'm encouraging and i'm i'm certainly supporting the project of of having the the, the paintings in the in the collection uh, digitized so uh, i'm just hoping that individuals will will support this project i know everything costs money and uh, you know, let, let's do it. Let's let's start um, making this art available to anyone, regardless of where you live in Canada. That you can see what is there. So again, um, this wishes to everyone that's there and and uh, continued continued work. And hopefully, when this COVID thing gets over, uh, you know, we get to travel more. That I'll make a trip to Toronto and get to meet some of you people. So thank you again. Thank you very much. This has been Art Talk with a uh, renowned award-winning Canadian painter uh, Peter Shostak, who joins us from uh, Courtenay, British Columbia. Thank you very much, Mr. Shostak, for finding the time to talk to us. Thank you. Thank you for calling me, and hopefully this will be a benefit and certainly be, be shared with other artists. So thank you. Thank you.